this folks I'm going to do a countdown just like the time clock would be for a rocket that's going to take off from Canaveral Florida at Kennedy Space Center we'll go three two one and then we're going to throw that rocket in the air and then we're going to get that rocket so let's do one check Chris we want to go ahead and make sure we got sound yeah we don't want no challenger happening I hear it good all right, so remember, everybody's got to be really quiet. Can we 
we hear the beep? All right. Are we ready? Altimeters are a go. Thumbs up. I see it. Recovery, thumbs up. Recovery is a thumbs up. Pad is a go. Three, two, one, launch. Beautiful rocket. Now he's going to be almost launching right back on the pad. Wow. And we have hit the ground. That is almost SpaceX level accurate. Oh, <laughs> that was excellent, Paulo. Great job. All right, we have the switch already ready to go. You ready to hear the sound of the go for launch? I have a thumbs up from everybody that we're go. All right, here we go. Three, two, one. Okay, that's all right. That's what we call a misfire. We're gonna check it. Chances are it has nothing to do with your rocket. It most likely has to do with the connection, the electrical connection between the two. Or it was Dave. Or it was Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we really blame Dave. I think it's the easier way. Didn't happen. Didn't that happen like to the Gemini rocket or something? It, it was happened rise, to quite a few rockets. Yeah. On, so, uh, based on what I've been told, about 50% of manned launches oh. actually don't happen. That's true. That's so, like. Fun. 50% of the time that there's a rocket that's meant to launch people into space, they say, all right, that one didn't work. Maybe God's like, later. you're not going anywhere. You're staying here. <laughs> we are not going to launch it. And number four. Here we go, folks, again in three, two, one. We have liftoff. Nice. Wow. That's a good one. Really good. the trigger. Beautiful. Look at that parachute now. Everybody keep an eye on that rocket oh, as best we tram. can for those who are watching and spotting. And on the tram. Get off that tram. It, oh, oh, so close. Close. it was almost <laughs> on the tram. All right, so I got to go from my recovery, go from the pad. Everybody's got a thumbs up here on altimeters. Three, two, one. Oh no, is it a mission fail? Oh dear. Oh! <laughs> I'm not even sure. Let me explain that one to you because that was among the most interesting rockets. That was good, that was entertaining. That, I'm going to tell you, was not anyone's fault right here. Pathfinder, not your fault. What happened on that rocket as it thrusted from the pad? Remember when I handed you that bar that everybody got to hold and we put it inside the launch lug area where your rocket stood straight up? When that rocket went off, that bar actually shifted about 45 degrees from the time the what? rocket took off. So that rocket shot at a 45 degree angle off that pad. And that's a rough guesstimation because I didn't have anything to measure. I'm just giving you a guesstimation. 45 degree angle. Do we, do we get altitude calculated? <laughs> <laughs> Some can see, some can't see at all. Do they happen to know how, uh, about like football fields? Yes. Yeah. That's a good cool. That, 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 I have a great good. comparison for that. That's a really good one. All right, there's kind of a, a rise on the side here. We're going to go around it. And then you're going to go over a series of bumps. Where's Steven? He is actually working a different program today. Oh. He's a good kid, young man. He's my kid, so he's a kid. Always be my baby. Did you guys want to do the face challenge set or just do the mazes for the TV3 today? You only have one day for TV3. All right, Christopher, you've got one, you go on and lead him over to the engine in a minute. Jesus Christ, this big engine. So is this the engine of the Saturn V? This is the first stage engine of the Saturn V. Oh. 
So this is the first stage engine of the Saturn V. It is the also the largest rocket engine in the world to this day. Um, standing at, I think around 12 feet tall, and this is only the, and there were five of these on the Saturn V that were able to get it off the ground initially. Now this engine is so big that you could literally have a bonfire inside of it and that would not even reach close to the temperatures that were when it was fully operated. It ran off of kerosene and liquid oxygen, so um, pretty close to what you put in your car. And it, it um, was also gimbalable. So that means that this entire engine, while it was operating, could actually move to steer the vehicle. This works because when you point the direction of thrust away from the rocket, you actually get a um, force that shifts the rocket to the side, either side that you're pointing it away from. So what uh, what I'd like to do, guys, just for the sake of time, because we have an amazing guest speaker coming in just about a few moments. Come on up here, walk around. Let's do it clockwise again. Walk around this F1 engine, get a sense. So it'll be a bit of a rise, and then there's going to be a door. <laughs> Holy moly cannoli. Now that what? is amazing. <laughs> so, you know what? Uh, air 100 feet is roughly? Yeah. Wow. So, we're standing at the back of the actual uh, booster engines for this rocket. <laughs> I'd climb down. I'd make it. <laughs> Imagine being under it when the engine's at night. That's called instant death. Imagine being inside a rocket. Not inside, like under it before it's about to be launched. There's a railing. What is this? Oh. Dude, that is amazing. All right, everybody, pause right here. Y'all wait right here. Wait right here. This rocket is about 360 something feet long. So this rocket is longer than a, an entire football field. All right, let's keep moving on around. So it's longer than the ISS. Yes. yes. Wow. Wait, but is it longer than the Titanic, though? Uh, yeah. Um, the Titanic is, I think, a bit bigger. Oh. Not, it wouldn't be by much, though. The first stage, the whole point of it, guys, is just to get people off of, um, out of Earth's gravity. And so, again, with those five F1 engines you saw outside, we have uh, used liquid oxygen and uh, liquid kerosene, which is kind of weird. Um, and then <laughs> it used, was used for two and one half minutes. That's it. Two and a half minutes to get them to about 30, 38 miles high. That's it. Oh. So we're still going by the first stage, and will be for quite a while. Wait. How much fuel was in the first stage rocket? Well, that's a good question. Uh, let me see if I can find that. Um, looks like the uh, kerosene was 214, roughly 215,000 gallons. Um, the liquid oxygen, 350,000 gallons. The fuel weight was over 5 million pounds. 
We're coming to the end of that first stage. Except for this. Now all the fuel combined, guys, if you had a car that got about roughly 30 miles per gallon, you could go around the earth. Um, let's see, 800 times with that much fuel. Excuse us, I'm so sorry. Uh, that's okay, go ahead, go ahead. Hang on a second. Another thing you might be very interested in knowing is that uh, the whole combined weight of the, the Saturn V rocket is about the same, the same size as 400 elephants. There you go. We are now at the second stage. Woo. So the second stage, you're two and a half minutes into flight. It flies for another about six minutes. Um, it is looking at uh, oxygen and Hydrogen, which and it's going to get you to 115 miles a year. And something also about the second stage. It did not have two separate tanks for the oxidizer and fuel. It had one tank with a divider in between. And this was actually a mistake <laughs> on the communications part. Long story short, the first stage team because they were contracting out to a different team, saw, oh, we have all this weight to play with, great. They made their stage too heavy, and they had to take whatever they could out of the second stage, and that included having two separate tanks. So that diagram is a lot. Yep. <laughs> oh, <laughs> kind of. All right, we're, I am now coming to the end of the second stage. You guys are not too far behind me. We'll be at the end of the second stage soon, too. We have now um, got to exceed about 15,500 miles per hour. So we need the third stage to actually get to the moon. We kind of talked about a little bit that yesterday, what that looked like. It's a very strange thing. Some of you got to, uh, Stephen, I know, talk you through lunar injection and how that worked. Um, you, we no longer have a railing on your right, but now we're coming up to the third and final stage. Only one little engine. One little J2 engine. Still a pretty big engine, but compared to those other ones, much smaller. This is also the only Saturn V stage that actually crashed into the moon on purpose. So what they would do is mid-flight, they would dump this stage uh, when they were on a direct trajectory to the moon and they would crash into moon so that by the time they got there, they would have little artificial earthquakes that they could measure. Can we walk up? Um, you know what? Just for time, let's say no. A, a oh. um, so the third stage also, um, it only took about a two minute burn to put you into orbit, but then once you're ready to go for the uh, moon, um, then it, it would uh, speed up the rocket to 25,000 miles per hour. How does it make it back from the moon? It uses gravity. Assist. It does. It's exactly right. It uses a gravity assist. Yeah, gravity assist. It's like a slingshot maneuver. All right, guys. Again, I want to just come back here from um, 15 minutes. You're going to really enjoy that. Take a few seconds to get pictures if you want to, and then let's get back in that train. Not here. I've had, I've, I've had a baby one before. I've also eaten one. It's delicious. It tastes like chicken. Tastes like chicken? It really does. Really? All right, we're going to depart uh, to your right, and we're going to go back in Silver Moon. Uh, Uh, we have uh, juice and water in for 